All right, we're going to get started. Um, thank you all for coming. I know it has been a long day, but I hope it has been uh, an engaging one and one in which you have learned a lot and um, and you know thought deeply about uh, some some really great issues. And I think uh, this panel will be uh, another opportunity. Uh, to do that. My name is Brooke Hopkins. I am the executive director of the Criminal Justice Policy Program here at Harvard Law School. Uh, we call ourselves CJPP. And we are a relatively new organization. We're in our third year, but we have uh, we have amassed a, a, a great docket of, um, of work in that short time. We work on uh, criminal justice policy reform. So, uh, you know, most of the criminal justice uh, work at the law school that students uh, have an opportunity to partic participate in is uh, direct litigation, direct service litigation um, on the prosecution side and on the defense side. We do policy work, um, and we work on we work with policymakers and with other stakeholders and with advocates uh, across the country on really cutting edge. Uh, criminal justice issues. Um, to give you a couple of examples, we work on bail reform issues, and we've we, we've uh, written a a report on bail that um, has been cited in court cases um, and is used by advocates. And then we've also worked in specific jurisdictions on specific uh, reform um, initiatives. We work on criminal justice fines and fees. We do. Uh, we serve as a national policy hub for fines and fees work across the country. Um, we we created a, a web tool um, for advocates to use that that co that collects all of the statutory and regulatory information about the way that your every state in the country um, charges criminal justice fines and fees, which is a really important tool to figuring out to to sort of starting local um, policy solutions to some of these problems. Um, we also work on police technology, and uh, we did we worked with the Boston Police Department on their uh, body camera pilot project, and um, we've also worked on sort of a more theoretical level, thinking about uh, how to fill the regulatory vacuum uh, that is that um, is occurring now as a result of the rapid emerging of uh, the rapid pace of technology uh, and the way that it's being adopted by police departments um, with very little st structure framework of regulation. Uh, we've also done some projects thinking about the role of the prosecutor and, um, and rethinking that model, thinking about reform-oriented prosecutors and what that might mean and how that might work. Um, and we also did a project, a clemency project, at the end of uh, the Obama administration. So we do a, a lot of work on a variety of issues, and, and students are involved in all of this work. Uh, so it's a great opportunity for Harvard Law students to be a part of this uh, exciting work and these important conversations. So we are hosting this panel today uh, to kind of give you a sense of um, some of the stories of folks who are doing this work uh, on the ground. Um, so to introduce our panel, of storytellers, um, I want to uh, ask Alex Whiting here to, to, to come up. Alex is a faculty co-director of CJPP, um, and he teaches uh, criminal law and evidence and uh, other classes related to, to criminal law here at um, the law school, including the seminar that CJPP does with students who work on our policy projects. So Alex Whiting. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we're very excited to have this panel today, these, these two speakers um, who are um, enormously inspirational in the work that they do, and we're looking forward to hearing their stories about their work and their experiences. Um, it's my privilege to introduce um, Jeff Robinson, who's um, class of 19, Harvard Law School class of 1981. Um, he is a deputy legal director of the ACLU and the director of the ACLU Trone Center for Justice and Equality, which works on criminal justice, racial justice, and reform issues. Um, before that, he was a uh, criminal defense lawyer in Seattle, a state and federal public defender, and also worked in private practice. Um, he has tried over 200 criminal cases to verdict. Uh, I'm guessing we might hear about one or two. Um, he was an original member of the John Adams Project, which was established by the ACLU to support 
uh, military council at Guantanamo Bay, um, and he himself worked on behalf of one of the five men held at Guantanamo Bay charged with carrying out the 9-11 attacks. Um, he lectures on trial skills across the country. He's a faculty member of the National Criminal Defense College in, Ma in Macon, Georgia, past president of the Washington Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and an elected fellow of the American College of Trial Attorneys. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Robinson. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I will say that when I was in school here, I did not anticipate that I would be back here on a panel celebrating the 200th anniversary of Harvard Law School. That's for another time and place. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> what I want to do is to talk about the people that I work with and the work that they're doing. The National ACLU is divided into three centers. And my center, the Trone Center for Justice and Equality, is named that way because a man named David Trone, who owns a company called Total Wine, that some of you may be familiar with, uh, made a huge donation to the ACLU. I was able to negotiate not to have Trone tattooed across my forehead, <laughs> but I, my center is now called the Trone Center. <laughs> and the Trone Center for Justice and Equality is made up of four projects, the Capital Punishment Project, the National uh, Prison Project, the Criminal Law Reform Project, and the Racial Justice Program. The director of the Racial Justice Program, Dennis Parker, is sitting in the back of the room. And I, Dennis is going to have to leave. And Dennis, I've got you all at the end, so you may not be here when I talk about the great work that you're doing. Um, the ACLU started several years ago uh, something called a Campaign for Smart Justice. And this is a campaign that was funded by the Open Society Foundation with the intent or purpose of reducing the prison population by 50%. There are any number of campaigns or movements around the country that are focusing on the prison population. And I think I just wanted to highlight this because my center, the Trone Center, is working hand in hand with the Campaign for Smart Justice to try and affect what we consider to be the most important criminal law and racial justice reforms that we can work on. And there are several things about both the ACLU and the Campaign for Smart Justice that I think is important. And what's going to be interesting is that I think when you hear Alec get up and talk, what you're going to hear is somebody that has started an organization that is completely different from the ACLU, but the principles that he's going to be following and talking about are principles that anybody working on criminal justice reform had better understand. Litigation is critical to what we do. And we're here at Harvard Law School, and there are lawyers who are going to be litigators. It is some of the most important work that will happen. But if you think litigation will save the country from the criminal justice woes that we have, you are wrong. It is litigation plus legislation, plus community engagement, plus advocacy, plus education. And this kind of integrated advocacy is what is going to be necessary to truly tackle the criminal justice challenges that we have in America. That is a chart that anybody who is familiar with criminal justice is going to be aware of. And one of the things that you see from that chart is this. If you let out every single person in federal custody tomorrow, we still got more than 2 million people in prison. And what that means is that while the Trump administration and the policies that it wants to pursue and advocate, they are important. And it's important to understand how they can be harmful. This game is not going to be won at the, state, at the federal level. This is a state game that we are engaged in. And one of the things that the Campaign for Smart Justice is trying to do in partnership with other organizations is to pr create a blueprint for each of the states. Because if you looked at this pie chart and you had a similar pie chart for each state in the country, the divisions would look absolutely different. And what I mean by that is if Arizona wants to adjust its criminal law reform issues, the policy changes that they need to make will be completely different 
than what Arkansas needs to do. And that will be different than what Pennsylvania needs to do. There are definitely going to be some common elements across the systems, but understanding that this is a fight that is going to be won at the state and local level. This is a place where the state and local politicians, state and local policies can actually impact and drive what happens in the federal policies. So I want to tell you a story about the Capital Punishment Project. These are lawyers who work in my center. They are housed in Durham, North Carolina, some of the finest lawyers in the country. And I want to tell you about how they engage with other partners in the state of Florida. Because this is what Florida was like in January of 2016. Death row was bloated. Ten executions in the calendar year before that. The governor signed a bill to speed up executions, and then something happened. Hearst versus Florida. And the US Supreme Court decided that the Florida scheme was unconstitutional because in Florida, it was the judge rather than the jury who would decide on the existence of aggravating factors and their weight. And the jury didn't have to be unanimous. The jury could recommend life or death, didn't have to be unanimous. Well, the US Supreme Court heard that case, and we argued in an amicus brief, our capital punishment project, that the historic right to a jury is a right to a unanimous jury, especially where execution is involved. And one of the things I would say to you is that if you are looking at history, and at the end of my comments, I'm going to say something about that. If you look at history, you'll notice, for example, that the state of Louisiana is one of the only states where you can be convicted of a felony on less than a unanimous verdict. Ten to two will get you convicted in Louisiana. If you go back into the history of the Louisiana legislature and the Louisiana state constitution, what you're going to see is people saying this. Slavery is over, but we need these black people to be working, and we don't want to pay them. And one way we can get that to happen is if we convict them of crimes, because then we can put them in prison and put them on prison labor gangs. So let's have 10 to 2 to make it just a little bit easier to maintain our economic status. Well, the Supreme Court decided that the Sixth Amendment requires a jury, not a judge, to impose the death penalty, and they remanded to the Florida Supreme Court. But Florida wasn't done yet. The legislature passed a law, and they said, OK, jury sentencing for execution, but it doesn't have to be unanimous. And our capital punishment uh, project, once again, worked with other lawyers around the country, filed briefs in that case, and on October uh, 14th of 2016, the Florida Supreme Court adopted our position and the position of our partners. No, the jury has to impose it. It has to be unanimous. And this applies to all cases that were decided after Ring. There are 200 people on death row in Florida who are now going to have new sentencing hearings. That means 200 families that are not going to have to watch a relative die in an execution chamber. The Supreme Court denied the state's request for cert to review Hearst versus State, which was the state's retroactivity decision. And the Capital Punishment Project is leading trainings for lawyers in Florida to do resentencing hearings, saying to the state, do you really want to pay for 200 sentencing hearings again to try and institute the death penalty in Florida? The National Prison Project is one of the other projects that works in the center that I have the honor to lead. And they do just what you would think. They work to try and protect the people who are serving time in prison, because I have a message for everybody in this room, and I think you know it. Nine out of 10 people who are in prison are coming back. And how would you like them to come back? Would you like them to come back after they have been sexually and physically abused in prison, given no training or education to do anything, given no kind of tools to be successful when they come out, and would you like them to move into your neighborhood saying, let's see what would happen? Or would you like them to be treated somewhat differently? These are the things that the National Prison Project has worked on. 
issues that have a major and direct impact on how we are treating the people that we choose to imprison. I believe that when Alex stands up, you are going to hear something about people living in cages. And as I've said, those people are coming back. If you ever saw the movie Silence of the Lambs, do you remember the institute where Dr. Lecter was held, where uh, 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 Jodie Foster went in to see him the first time? That was the Baltimore City Jail, the actual Baltimore City Jail, where people were housed until recently. The National Prison Project worked extensively to get that shut down. The East Mississippi Correctional Facility, one of the private prisons that is now sparking up and going uh, and coming up all around the country, private prison companies are either building prisons or taking over state-built prisons and running them because there is money in the criminal justice system. When you look to see who it is that is advocating against criminal justice reform, You'll find private prison companies right at the top because they need the clients. And the National Prison Project has led a, a, a campaign to stop and eliminate solitary confinement in the United States prison system, and they've done that since 2010. And that is just an example of some of the states where they have made substantive gains in eliminating solitary confinement. And I, I have to uh, apologize. I don't know if I've dropped any F-bombs yet, but there may be one or two that come when I start talking about this. Um, because understanding what solitary confinement is and what it does to a person psychologically and emotionally is significant. And if you took a tour through a solitary confinement facility and you understood what happens to a human being, you would be sick to your stomach. And the most conservative law and order person in the world cannot make a substantive argument that says, let's abuse people that we put in prison to make sure that when they come out of prison, they're going to re-enter our community as meaningful, healthy people? It doesn't make any sense. Dennis, you're still here, and I'm glad. Dennis Parker runs the Racial Justice Program. And this is a program that has worked tirelessly to achieve racial justice, not just in the criminal justice area, but in other areas in America. We know that racial justice and criminal justice walk hand in hand because people that look like me make up about 12% of the population and about 46% of the prison population. And we can have another discussion on another day about why that is. Maybe blacks are just more violent. Maybe blacks are just more tending to be criminals. We can have another discussion when I have more time about that. But this is part of the work that the Racial Justice Program is doing for one of the most forgotten populations in this country, and that's Native Americans, the people that we stole the country from when we got started. It's easy to forget that because the narrative that we tell about racial and criminal justice in America is one of the most false narratives that has ever existed in United States history. They filed and settled debtor's prison cases. We heard from uh, Brooke about the debtor's prison work that people are doing here. And when you think about debtor's prison, it's essentially people that have fines and fees and they can't pay the money, so they go to jail. We have ACL lawyers that have sat in courtrooms where judges are telling a population of mostly black and brown faces, get on the telephone, call your relative, call your sister. You better get $25 down here, because if you don't, you're going to jail. Debtor's prison and bail issues, and Alec has done amazing work on some bail issues that he'll talk about, but my view is it's the opposite side of the same coin. In each situation, I understand there's some different law in each situation, but in each situation, somebody is standing in front of a judge and they want to go home, and the judge wants money before they can go home. And that issue alone is an issue that has 
infected the criminal justice system in ways you can't imagine. Let me just give you this brief scenario. You're arrested tonight for driving while intoxicated. And I'm talking about the people in this room. Most of the people in this room will have the money so that they can bail out tonight, be home by Saturday, and you'll be at work Monday morning. You'll never have to say a word to your boss. And if you get the case settled because you hire a good lawyer, nobody may ever find out about it, and you're just marching on. But if you don't have money, you get held in jail tonight. And when your family doesn't know where you are, they're going to find out maybe tomorrow if you can call them and say, hey, I'm in jail. And now you've got a decision to make. Do I call my boss and say, I got arrested on a DUI, please don't fire me, I'm going to take care of it, and, and worry about being fired because you got arrested? Or do you call your boss and lie and say, you know what, I'm sick, I'll be back to work on Wednesday. And then if they find out that you lied about it, you lose your job because you lied. And if you lose your job, one of the things that people don't realize is so many folks in America are living paycheck to paycheck. People that are considered, quote unquote, middle class, you take the paycheck away and you can't pay rent. And when you can't pay rent, you get evicted. And now you're charged with a crime and you're homeless. And now see how your life starts to revolve around the water going down the toilet. Fair housing is one of the other issues that the racial justice program has worked on. And maintaining and expanding federal, state, and local requirements about data collection. Data collection is critical in the debate about criminal justice, especially when you are trying to impact people to the right of center. When you can show data, data is important for everybody, but I'll tell you what has impacted people to the right of center. The money. And when the money that is spent on criminal justice systems is such that it starts to bankrupt communities, you now have people that are willing to listen and say, you know what, maybe we can do something other than imprison those people. You know what, maybe the sentences shouldn't be so long. And so people understanding that economic uh, uh, reality is something that should be taken into account in the criminal justice system, that's fine. And I think it's a, it's a tool that can help us move things forward. But I don't want you to mistake arguments about money and economy in the criminal justice system for arguments about justice in the criminal justice system. This is one of the reports that RJP worked on, Bullies in Blue. And it details what police officers are doing to our children in school. I am freaked out completely when I see what kids get arrested for today for what they did in school. I went to Catholic schools growing up. And the stuff I did in schools, man, I guess I would be a felon by this point. Disrupting school, that's a criminal charge that people seven, eight, and nine years old are getting arrested for and getting convictions on their record. Spraying perfume, fake burping, fake fart spray, fake fart spray again, refusing to change a t-shirt depicting a hunting rifle, not following instructions, criticizing a police officer, kids were charged with crimes for these behaviors. Disorderly conduct, kicking a trash can, cursing, refusing to leave the lunchroom, documenting bullying, assault, throwing a paper airplane, throwing a baby carrot, throwing Skittles, and fake fart spray one more time. <laughs> and it would, it is funny if it weren't so freaking unbelievable. The criminal justice system is getting involved in this stuff. And this is what the racial justice program is working on. You put out this report, you understand that students handcuffed during mental health crisis, look who gets handcuffed. And look who gets handcuffed when nobody ends up getting charged with a crime. And explain to your nine-year-old when they come home how they should feel when they've been handcuffed in school for acting like a kid. The Criminal Law Reform Project is one of our other projects, and they have done substantially great work as well. 
This is a lawsuit that was just filed in South Carolina. You are taught here in school that if you are charged with a crime where you can go to jail, you have the right to a lawyer. That's just black letter constitutional law. And you may be sitting here thinking that that's the truth in every state in America. And it's not. In states all over America, people are sent to jail without a lawyer, and judges don't even tell them they have a right to a lawyer. This is happening in our country. The prosecutor is the arresting police officer who questions himself about his own credibility and makes arguments about his own credibility to the judge. That's the Criminal Law Reform Project and some of the kind of cases that they work on because these things are what's going on behind the curtain in America. This is the true narrative about criminal justice in America. Do you understand that in the last five years, over $1 billion has been paid in police misconduct cases? And yet officers in Oklahoma and Minnesota are acquitted when video cameras show them essentially executing black men. The Criminal Law Reform Project cannot replace the Department of Justice and 19,000 lawyers in the Department of Justice. Under the Obama administration, we had a Department of Justice that was interested in investigating these things. That's not going to happen anymore. Part of what the ACLU has to do is with our partners to try and step in and fill some of that gap. And I'm going to get to that in a second. The Clemency Project was something that the Criminal Law Reform Project was involved in, and that released almost 1,000 prisoners uh, who would have stayed in prison otherwise. We have filed a lawsuit in Idaho and in Missouri about challenging public defender systems that are radically underfunded, where in Missouri, public defenders are given a choice of a public defender was just, I think, disbarred for not giving adequate defense to a criminal defendant, and his defense was, my caseload is too big. Those same public defenders are held in contempt when they tell the trial court judges, I can't take any more cases. We're filing lawsuits in those circumstances. So it gives you an idea of what the Criminal Law Reform Project and those lawyers are doing. And I want to talk for a second about the value of reports. Because the Massachusetts State Supreme Court issued an opinion not too long ago that essentially said a young black man running from the police without more is not probable cause. And the basis for that decision was an ACLU of Massachusetts report that demonstrated that 75% of the people stopped in Boston's version of stop and frisk were absolutely innocent. And one of the things I suggest to you is you cannot stop crime by stopping and frisking innocent people. There is no there there. There is no connection. And so I'll talk about one report that our center did, a report called Back to Business. And this is an example of the kind of collaboration I was talking about, because we have in the room the human uh, resources director of Walmart. We have representatives from Coke Industries. And at the same time, when you see key advisors, each one of those key advisors is a formerly incarcerated person who is running an organization supporting formerly incarcerated people. And before we produced this report, we sat down with them to say, instead of us telling you what it is you need, how about you tell us? You're the people that walked out of prison one day trying to reintegrate yourselves into the community. Why don't you tell us what you need? And this report that was put out has demonstrated that there are all kinds of reasons to see formerly incarcerated people as exactly what they are, incredible human resources that we cannot afford to waste. 
So I want to do this. If I have like three more minutes or five more minutes, education is part of what we are focused on. Can I see a show of hands in this room? How many people know who the Colonial Marines were? This is one of the most educated audiences in America. And I am not saying this to humiliate or embarrass anybody. Everything I'm about to show you as I end my part of this presentation are things that I learned in the last seven years. I'm 61 years old. I was born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm 11 years old when King is assassinated. My parents were deep in the civil rights movement. It wasn't something I read about. It was something I lived through. And I was humiliated when I found out what I don't know about the history of race in this country. Because in my view, I've already said, the history of race is inexorably tied to criminal justice in this country. And until we recognize what that history actually is, we will never solve this problem. George Orwell wrote, who controls the past controls the future. And when you control the narrative about what happened in the past, you control the narrative about where we need to go in the future. And he also said this, who controls the present controls the past. And the narrative we are hearing from our federal government right now about race in America is a false one. The colonial marines were black slaves that fought with the British during the War of 1812. And there's a woman who went to Harvard Law School here, a woman named Chloe Coburn, who graduated several years ago. And her great, 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 something great aunt or, or grandfather or uncle or something, a guy named Alexander Cockburn, was, a, was the uh, admiral of the British who got these colonial marines to fight with them. About three months before Francis Scott Key was in Baltimore, getting inspired to sing the, or write the national anthem. He was involved in an engagement with the British and the colonial marines. And the technical military term is, they got their asses handed to them. The Americans were driven back into Washington, DC. The White House was set on fire. And Francis Scott Key wrote, what if they all do that? Meaning, the slaves. So. How many people know the third verse of the National Anthem? Can I see a show of hands? And folks, I, there's one hand. I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I'm asking you to share my humiliation. I want you to experience our National Anthem. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose brush stripes and bright stars through the 
Dennis Parker in the Racial Justice Program are representing the young woman who was picked up out of that chair in a South Carolina school and thrown across the classroom by the police officer because she wouldn't stop looking at her cell phone. The history of race in America is a history you do not know. It is a history that has been hidden from us because the South may have lost the Civil War, but they won the peace, and they won it big time. If you are going to uh, deal with criminal justice reform in America, you have to deal with racism in America. And part of our educational efforts are going to be to ask Americans to share with us what we are referring to as a naked lunch moment with race in America. William Burroughs wrote the book, Naked Lunch, and he was asked, what does that title mean? And let me just say, don't read that book. That's a horrible book. You don't want that stuff bouncing around in your head. But he said, what does the title mean? It means that moment when everyone has to look at what is really on the end of their fork. The ACLU is going to be asking America to have a naked lunch moment with the true history of race. Because if we do, we will be compelled to do more about criminal justice in America. Thank you. All right, so to introduce our, our next um, speaker, uh, I'm gonna ask Carol Steiker, who is the other faculty co-director of CJPP to come up. Um, she, uh, her scholarship focuses primarily on the death penalty, but she teaches basically anything in involving criminal law at Harvard Law School, Carol Steiker teaches or has taught, um, so. Thanks, Jeff, thanks so much for that. Um, really powerful uh, presentation. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to Harvard Law School, welcome you back to Harvard Law School, uh, many of those in the audience, along with Brooke and Alex. Uh, I welcome you on behalf of CJPP, the Criminal Justice Policy Program, a relatively new initiative here at the law school, and we're very proud to be hosting uh, this event today, in this you know, day of terrific events. And I'm especially pleased to be able to introduce my former student, Alec Carrot Katsanis, uh, who I remember not long ago graduated, will be 10 years ago this coming spring, but it seems like yesterday that a bright-eyed and idealistic Alec was in class, and now he's a bright-eyed and idealistic reformer who is leading the charge uh, of a, a movement that's moving like wildfire uh, uh, across the United States to reform uh, America's practices of money bail, which have flown below the radar of uh, public policy conversation for far too long. So Alec graduated from Harvard Law School and worked in, his, in the early days of his career as a public defender at the DC Public Defender Service and as a federal defender in Alabama. And then he, I'm very proud to say this too, he applied for seed grant funding from a new Harvard initiative that I was also part of the committee that created, the Public Service Venture Fund, an in-house Harvard Law School uh, social justice entrepreneurship fund. Um, and Alec, along with one of his classmates, applied for seed money to start the uh, organization Equal Justice Under Law. Uh, which began to uh, advocate for the rights of some of the most vulnerable people in, in the criminal justice system. Alec went on uh, more recently to found the Civil Rights Corps, which he now directs, and he's made bail reform one of his central issues. We at CG, CJPP have partnered with Alec and the Civil Rights Corps, but really they've been uh, going uh, around the country having remarkable, really stunning success in litigation, challenging bail practices across the country. Um, one of his um, more recent victories, which you may have read about, uh, is a, a huge decision in Texas uh, striking down Harris County, that's Houston's uh, bail practices, uh, 
I, the reason I think you may have re read about it is if you, like me, get your news from the New York Times online, the New York Times posted some of the videos of Houston judges setting bail, which, uh, if you haven't seen them, uh, are really quite stunning. Uh, and the victory in that case and in many other cases is really the, you know, can be traced directly back to Alec Karakatsanis. So I give you Alec, who uh, is here to speak to all of us today. Thank you. So uh, it's a real uh, honor to be asked to speak here. I could not have imagined uh, when I graduated here, having said many of the things that I had said when I was a student here, that I would be asked to come. I don't know what, what you were alluding to earlier during your time here, but, but for me, it, it's, really, um, it's, it's really great and a testament to, to Harvard uh, that they invited me back uh, just, just nine short years after I said so many things. Um, so, so let me, out of respect and, and mercy for those of you who just sat through me speaking for an hour and a half on a different panel, um, and, and since I come here a lot and I, and I say a lot of things about my, my views on our, on our criminal legal system and our society generally, I thought just for this brief period, I would tell a couple of stories. And I won't say anything, I won't talk at you too much about my views of our criminal legal system. But I think stories are really at the heart of everything that we try to do as advocates and everything that we try to do at Civil Rights Corps. So I encourage you to go to the Civil Rights Corps website if you're interested in looking at more of our work. It's civilrightscorps.org, including a incredible, fantastic new case we brought with the ACLU uh, suing the district attorney in New Orleans and 10 individual prosecutors. Uh, we're launching a prosecutor project, which is going to be an effort to do what we did with fines and fees and with bail uh, in the world of the American prosecutor, and that is to tell a different story, a different narrative about who prosecutors are and what they're doing and, and, and the effect that they have on our, on our legal system and our society. Uh, so with that, let me just... Um, let me talk a little bit about what I did uh, shortly after Harvard uh, gave me some money to start uh, being a civil rights lawyer. The first thing I did was I bought a plane ticket with Harvard's money, and I went to uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And I rented a car, and I started driving around to different municipal courts all throughout the South. Uh, and I, my intention was to go visit some of my old colleagues in Montgomery and to sort of meander around uh, and, and until I got to Montgomery. And everywhere I went, um, I saw things that really shocked me. That maybe they shouldn't have shocked me. I had read all about our criminal legal system. I'd been a public defender for four and a half years at that point. But nonetheless, the things I saw uh, in those few weeks, uh, that road trip, uh, affected the, the course of the rest of my career. I saw in town after town, as Jeff was describing some of the ACLU lawsuits, um, that have been filed in the last few years, I saw human beings being thrown in cages because they couldn't make small monetary payments. And I saw this in every single courtroom I visited. And I finally made it back to Montgomery, where I used to live. I lived in Montgomery for two and a half years, right after I left Harvard Law School. And, and before I went and visited the judge that I clerked for in Montgomery or saw my old friends at the public defender's office, I decided to go check out the Montgomery Municipal Court. I arrived there, it was a very cold winter morning in early 2014, and uh, I walked into the courtroom, and there were 67 people, all of them black, uh, all of them in jail garb, handcuffed, uh, and not a single one of them was accused of a crime. They were all in jail because they couldn't afford to make a monetary payment from an outstanding traffic ticket. And... One by one, they were called up, and the judge would scream at them, give me my money, give me $1,000, you're going to jail, $3,000, you're going to jail. And one by one, in proceedings that I, I use the word proceedings because we're in a law school, in, 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 um, in a, a one-way dialogue from the judge that lasted about 5 to 10 to 15 seconds sometimes, they were thrown in jail. And for reasons I, we're being, is this being videotaped? So I won't go into why I was kicked out of the courtroom, but I was kicked out of the courtroom eventually. Um, and I, I, uh, <laughs> so I decided, well, um, why not just go up into the jail? And so I went up into the jail. I was wearing an a inside-out hooded sweatshirt, which is what I usually wear when I court watch. And uh, I walked into the jail, and I just started calling out the names of the people who I'd seen jailed until I was asked to leave the courtroom. 
And I guess the jailers didn't really know who I was, what I was doing. So they started bringing me uh, these people who I, whose names I called out. <laughs> and uh, I'll, you know, I'll never forget the, the first two people I met with. I'll never forget any of them, but I'll just, I don't have limited time here. I'm sure you have limited patience. Uh, the first woman I met was a woman named Charnel Mitchell. And Charnel had been in jail for a couple of weeks at that point. And she told me that she had been sitting on her couch with her one-year-old on her lap and her four-year-old next to her when police raided her home on a Sunday night. And they arrested her. They literally took the children out of her hands, left them there, and took her to jail because she owed money on traffic tickets from 2010, four years previously. And Charnel started crying, I think, as any young mother would, about not knowing where her kids were. She couldn't pay any money to use the jail's for-profit phone system, so she didn't know where her kids were, her babies. Um, She didn't know how she was going to get out of jail. She showed me her court document, and on her court document it said, pay us $2,807 or do 59 days in jail. And I asked her, now, why, how did they come up with this number, 59 days? She said, well, actually, in Montgomery, um, you get $50 a day for, toward your fines and fees for every day you do in jail. So I owed $2,800, so I guess that meant 59 days. And that actually, start, you know, that made me realize what I had seen downstairs. I saw the judge saying $2,000, 40 days, you know, $1,000, 20 days. And I didn't uh, understand what the formula was, but it made sense. But then on the back of her, she had, uh, a jail guard had given her a pencil. And on the back of this court document, she'd been writing uh, the days, 1 through 59. And each day she was writing 50, 50, 50, 75, 75. And then on the other side of the paper, she was subtracting these numbers from 2,807. She was trying to figure out when she, she could get home. And I, I said, why are you writing 75 some days? Uh, I thought you told me you get $50 a day. She said, well, if you agree to be a janitor and to clean the judge's office and clean the blood and feces off the the jail bars and the jail floor, they give you an extra $25 a day. And it dawned on me that the reason when I was a federal defender with my clients being held in the Montgomery City Jail, the reason I always saw an army of people in jail garb cleaning up everywhere was that they were local city debtors. And the city of Montgomery in the year 2014 was running uh, a modern-day debt peonage system of slave labor. And um, by the time she was done talking to me, the, the pencil was all smeared uh, with her tears. And I had brought my phone into the jail. Um, there was no sign saying you couldn't bring your phone into the jail, just for the people recording this. Um, <laughs> and I took a photograph of the court document. And um, the next man I met was a man named Lorenzo Brown. Lorenzo, I had actually seen his court appearance below. He did something very moving, I thought. He got down on his knees in the courtroom, and he begged the judge for mercy. He was the only one who I heard talk, really. He said uh, something to the effect of, I know I've made mistakes in my life, judge. I was a drug addict when I got these tickets, and I wasn't a very responsible person, but I found God, and Lord have mercy upon me. I'm throwing myself at the mercy of the court. Please don't put me in jail. And the judge said, pay me $2,000 or do 40 days in jail, and just shuffled him off. And uh, Lorenzo, understandably, when faced with uh, a person wearing an inside-out hooded sweatshirt who said he was a lawyer from Washington, D.C., uh, didn't believe me. Um, he I later laughed about this a lot, but he had no interest in uh, <laughs> talking to some guy who you know, no one had offered. And in fact, um, uh, I later found out that the person I thought was the prosecutor in the courtroom that day was actually the public defender. I'm a sophisticated courtroom observer. The things he was doing looked prosecutorial to me. He was asking the judge to jail people and telling the judge that they hadn't made an effort to pay money and things like that. Um, but that was his experience with defense lawyers. I later found out when, when we sued that um, his contract provided that he would not get paid unless enough money was collected from guilty pleas. Um, the public defender wouldn't get paid, yeah. Um, public defender in, in quotes, of course. Anyway, so, so Lorenzo said, I'm not talking with you unless my pastor gives me permission. Um, So I pulled out my phone again. Again, no signs. uh, And we called his pastor on speakerphone. And um, luckily for me, Harvard Law School had just posted on the internet an announcement of the Seed Grant Award. And his pastor read this aloud. 
And he said to Lorenzo, um, this man is an angel sent from God to help you. I said, no, actually, I'm not an angel at all. Uh, I just want to talk to you about what happened to you and maybe try to help. And he said, listen to this man, Lorenzo. And so uh, we hung up and he told me his whole story. Lorenzo and Charnel became my two first clients uh, as a civil rights lawyer. Uh, we filed a um, eventually what became a class action. I had really no idea what I was doing. I, I look back on this with, with horror a little bit. Um, luckily, um, this was before anyone was starting to file any of these lawsuits. So the good thing was the other side had no idea how to defend against them. So, um, And I, all I did really was I told their stories. I showed the federal judge who was a George W. Bush appointed uh, rural former state um, Republican prosecutor in Alabama. Uh, I showed him Charnel's the photograph. I showed them um, the, the handwritten jailhouse affidavits um, that Charnel and Lorenzo and the other clients had written. And, um, and this was the first time I'd ever done anything like this. And it helped me understand, for reasons that I'll get into a little bit more later, uh, the power of, of our clients' stories. And within a few weeks, um, the federal judge had issued a preliminary injunction. He was so appalled and outraged at what was going on that he ordered all of the top city officials to appear in front of him in person to explain how it could be that this was happening in Montgomery, Alabama in the year 2014. Rather than do that, the city just released everyone from its jail. And imagine what, it, what you have to think um, to, be, to be able on a single day to just release everyone from your jail. Imagine the, 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 what, what kind of reasons did you have to keep people in the jail if you're able to just release them all in a single day? Um, and again, a, a sort of theme in all of this work from the first moments that I started observing these courts um, is the incredible indifference that everyone working in them displayed to the brutality inherent in putting a human being in a cage. Um, so fast forward, you know, this, this was great. We then partnered with the Southern Poverty Law Center and a fantastic Harvard Law School graduate from just a few years after me named Sarah Zampirin, who many of you, or some of you may know. Um, and we met with the city of Montgomery and we designed a whole new municipal court system so that they had to, um, uh, follow a number of procedures, and, and we got rid of their private probation company, all kinds of other things, and um, including uh, that if they ever did jail anyone for not paying, which was pretty impossible given the procedures we had uh, outlined, they'd have to call my cell phone within 12 hours. And they haven't called my cell phone in almost three years. And so after that happened, um, oh. so I started realizing that this same problem was happening all over the country. And while I was in, involved in the negotiations with Montgomery, uh, Michael Brown was murdered in Ferguson. And I read an article about, um, about Ferguson that was written by a great organization, which is also partnered with uh, the institute here at Harvard called Arch City Defenders. And it described, uh, obviously everyone was very upset about the the violence against black men in St. Louis and the incredible history of that um, racially um, motivated violence in the city. But, but also there was something else going on. And it was the fundamental corruption of the entire law enforcement apparatus of these municipalities. So when I, I, I just called these folks in St. Louis and I said, I just did a similar case in Montgomery. Could I come to St. Louis and, and do something similar? And um, when I arrived in Ferguson during the protests, I just sort of embedded myself, um, hung out with protesters, started having these little meetings uh, with groups of homeless protesters or in people's houses, and they would invite um, their family and friends. And we'd get these big groups together, and everyone would go around and tell their stories. It was some of the most devastating stuff I've ever heard. You know, um, people talking about being in these jail cells with blood and mucus and feces on the walls, no hygiene products for weeks, um, just because they can't afford $100 or $150. This cycle of being shuffled to seven, eight, nine municipal jails because St. Louis has 81 municipalities, 80, 90 municipalities and 81 municipal courts and jails. So if you drive from the airport downtown St. Louis, you can pass through 20 cities. Each of them has a police force trying to make as much money as they can off tickets. So many of my clients had warrants out in seven or eight or nine or 10 cities. And so 
our name plaintiff in, in, in the Ferguson case, eventually every time she left her house, she was worried um, that she'd be arrested. And every time she was arrested, she would be she would spend three days in each jurisdiction because they figured out um, if you don't pay within three days, you cost them money, so they just send you to the next jail. So what they do is they say, in the first day, you owe $400. If you can't pay that, next day, well, about $300. Next day, what about $200? And then you get out for free. Um, it's an extortion racket. Anyway, so I'll never forget another moment during one of those, those house meetings. Someone told me, you know, she, she said, I, I love my children uh, so much, but, um, you know, I am also schizophrenic. And every time they would put me in these jails and I would be there for 15 or 16 or 20 days, they wouldn't give me my medication. And I would have these breakdowns. And the last time, I just, I just couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't live anymore knowing that every time I went to the grocery store to pick one of my kids up from school, I could just be taken away from them for weeks at a time. And so when I got to the last jail last time, I tried to strangle myself with my bra. And I think about that a lot. You know, as we've, as we've done, as, as Jeff mentioned, we subsequently started converting our, our fines and fees lawsuits into challenging the American money bail system. Um, because one of the, the next morning after I met that woman, actually, I was just in downtown St. Louis in a courtroom, and I saw another young mother uh, who'd been away from her newborn child. She'd just given birth a couple weeks, and she was getting a ride somewhere, and the police found a burned marijuana cigarette in the ashtray. Um, she was charged with marijuana possession. She couldn't pay $200, so she'd been in jail for three weeks. And when I saw her in that courtroom, the judge said to her, I'll let you out today um, if you plead guilty and take a fine. Uh, but if you want to fight your case, I'll set you for, the, for three weeks from now. We can have a trial. And she said, but can I get out of, of jail? She said, well, you, you have to pay the bail. She couldn't pay the bail. So she said, okay, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I don't know what happened in the car. It wasn't my marijuana, but tell me what to say. So he walked her through a guilty plea um, to a crime that she didn't commit, to a drug offense she didn't commit, because she was so desperate to get back to her kids. Um, that was uh, the, the moment... And it was a really painful experience to watch because they had to do it several times because at the key moment where he was trying to get her to say she knowingly possessed it, she kept saying, I didn't know it was there. Until finally she said, oh, you want me to say, oh, okay, yes, I knew there was marijuana in my friend's car. Um, and now that w this woman has a fine that she owes and she has a criminal record, which could affect all kinds of areas of her life forever. Um, and, I, and it was that moment that I realized the urgency of converting our fines and fees cases to challenge the American money bail system, which has 450,000 human beings in cages on any given night. Um, so uh, these stories, I could tell many, many more of them, are all, I think, very powerful examples of what happens um, when a legal system becomes desensitized to the brutality that's inflicting every single day. So we ended up um, filing, I don't know, 20 or so of these lawsuits against money bail systems around the country. And the same themes would pop up in every single case. The Harris County case that Professor Steiker mentioned, for example, there are about 130 suicide attempts every year in the Harris County jail. In the five years before we filed our lawsuit, 55 human beings died in the Harris County jail who were being held on a money bail amount they couldn't afford. Um, that's one of the reasons that the Harris County Sheriff and the Harris County DA actually testified for us at the trial. The people that are closest to this, that actually see the human costs of it, some of them, with the ones that have enough courage, say, I can't be a part of this anymore. That's the power of stories, when you have that human connection. Um, that's why I think that, that um, when we think in our organization about how to affect change, we don't think about it in terms of creating a legal doctrine um, or you know, arguing the, the finer distinctions between cases. First and foremost, we certainly do that stuff because it's important in the existing environment, but first and foremost, we think about our clients and their stories. And every day I get new stories. So a friend of mine in Alabama just called me a few days ago. They found a man who's been in jail for three years in Alabama on a drug possession charge because he couldn't pay $500 bail they haven't even tested the drugs yet. They don't even know what the drugs were. Um, and everyone forgot about this man because there's no public defender in this place. Three years, this guy in jail. Um, and I think that's what happens. Um, and that's, I've seen it, I, I'm sure you've seen it with your work all around the country. That's what happens when the people who are working in the system every single day lose sight 
of the consequences of their actions on human beings and their bodies. We've seen the same thing in San Francisco, the same thing in our cases in Chicago. This is not a problem that's affecting only Mississippi and Alabama, um, although there was a story yesterday in Mississippi that many of you probably heard about the woman who was barred from seeing her four-month-old child for 14 months because she couldn't pay court fines and fees. Um, that level of indifference to the consequences of, of our actions, at least when they're inflicted on poor people of color, uh, is a, a fundamental defining characteristic of our current existing legal system. I think that's an important point to be made. We're not talking about a few bad apples or a few bad actors. It's a system that is utterly desensitized to the harm that it's inflicting. And that's, I think, for me, the main purpose of our work is to tell those stories. So when we went to Montgomery Federal Court for that first hearing, I'd never done one of those hearings before and wasn't sure what was going to happen. Um, I was sure that there was going to be some doctrine that federal courts had concocted to prevent themselves from doing justice that I learned about in fed courts. But um, the other side didn't raise any of those. So I didn't have to argue all the legal points I was prepared to argue. And the judge, when he said those words, you know, I demand that every um, you know, official come before me in person. I looked over at my clients and they were, they were, they were patting each other on the back and they were smiling and they were, they were, they were very animated. And I didn't actually get a chance to see this, but I, I was later told by Sarah, the other um, Harvard Law School where she was in the audience watching because SPLC had come to watch the hearing. And uh, apparently when, when Lorenzo walked out of the courtroom, he, who, he was an older man and walked with a cane. Um, when he got to the threshold of the courtroom, Sarah held the door for him and he just paused and he looked down at his shoes and he muttered under his breath, wow, I never knew I had so much power. And that is for me, why we do this work. It's about using the power of stories and the things that our clients have endured, giving them a forum for him to tell his story to a federal judge in an open courtroom. It didn't even matter that the only people in the audience were one local journalist and a few lawyers from the Southern Poverty Law Center. His, his story touched a federal judge who then set in, into motion a course of events that changed the entire city of Montgomery's policies and that by extension have now really had a huge effect around the country in this area of fines and fees. Um, and then subsequently money bail. That moment where he felt empowered is the kind of thing that we endeavor to do every night. Every night. Um, and so personally, I try to think of a story like that from one of my clients in my cases every night before I go to bed to maintain this sense of urgency, this idea that I never want to become one of those lawyers who I saw every day in those courtrooms who become desensitized to the consequences of what we do. And it's what we try to, to teach our younger lawyers who work with us. Um, it's, it's the idea that we can't get ourselves out of this problem where our country is caging people at rates that are unprecedented in the recorded history of the modern world. It's not gonna happen by talking about saving a few extra dollars, right? Um, the point that Jeff was making. It's not going to talk about, it's not going to happen with a few legal victories on money bail. Because w w Jeff made this point, I think, very, very eloquently. Unless we address the underlying stuff, the economic and political and racial history here, um, the structural factors, what replaces money bail could be even worse than the current system of money bail. It could be a system of no bail detention. It could be a system where everyone is on some kind of GPS surveillance that they have to pay for and then get more fines and fees, right? So we don't think of our work as, you know, um, finding little tricky ways to prevail in a legal case with some cool doctrine that we might have learned in, in law school or read in a book. We think of our cases as a forum for telling a story, a forum for organizing people in the community around that story, and a forum for letting them share that story with the public. And as lawyers, taking a step back sometimes and just being there to help them tell that story. And so I think that's all I, I have to say right now. And I think the only thing that I would want to leave you with, um, in addition to that, is find 
those stories for you? What inspires you? It may not be the criminal law, it may not be these particular issues in the criminal law, but every day as you live your life, try to think, what do I feel urgent about? How can I live a life of real urgency to create a world where there's a little bit less suffering than the day before? And I think if you do that, and if you force yourself to do that really hard thing every day, it's not always easy to, to think about this stuff every day, but that's what we do when, when, when there are emergencies, and, and the criminal legal system in this country is an emergency. And I think we all have an obligation to undertake that very difficult task of confronting that in an urgent way every single day. So thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to questions. So in instead of coming before him, they just agreed to release everyone from the jail, and then they filed a motion saying that it was unnecessary for them to come before him because the whole problem had been fixed, and they were committed to it never happening again. I'll be interested to hear <clears throat> what Alec is uh, going to say about this. I started attending storytelling conferences about 15 years ago, and I go at least once a year uh, because it is an art, and it's an art that is as old. It is a racial art, and when I say racial, I mean human racial. If you go back to the caves in France in Altamira, 14,000-year-old paintings, those were the first opening statements. All they were were stories, and they're stories about where do you find the animals that we eat? What do they look like? What does their scat look like? And what kind of weapon do you use to kill them? And if those stories weren't clear, then tribes starved. So storytelling is, is at the essence of the way human beings understand the world. One of the things that <clears throat> I have talked to some kids here at school, and I'm getting myself invited back because one of the things that we do is that there is a three and a half hour presentation that we are having made into a documentary on race in America, the true story of our racial history, not the one that we all have adopted. And so one thing I would say to folks is, if you never heard the third verse of the national anthem, and anybody in this room has criticized Colin Kaepernick or any NFL player that has protested, I'd ask you to rethink that. Did you know that Jackie Robinson, who we now deify, wrote in his autobiography, I don't stand for the anthem and I don't salute the flag. We deify that man, but we forget conveniently the political stances that people before us have taken so that we can have a narrative that makes us comfortable with the way things are. So storytelling is, I think, I agree with Alec, it is going to be at the essence of what turns around uh, uh, the way we view the criminal justice system. And I'd be interested to know where you got your, your, your insight on. So uh, if you read, if you go to our website and you read some of our complaints, I th so we've been experimenting a lot since I first started doing this with pushing the boundaries of legal, legal writing and legal documents. Um, for example, our, our complaint in the Montgomery case, or better, probably the complaint in the Ferguson case is a good one to read, or the complaint in the Tennessee private probation 
case is maybe my favorite example of this. Um, they, 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 we try to be a little bit more journalistic than normal and to try to tell stories in a different way. And then throughout the, the case, we try to use language very deliberately. Um, I was speaking at Yale on a storytelling panel uh, at a conference last year. And as a joke, I actually said, um, if I could, I would much prefer to file poems as our briefs in cases. And actually, I said it as a joke, but I actually believe that you can reach people um, way more effectively um, by touching them um, and communicating through that medium. And so one of the, the main focuses of our work over the last few years has been working with journalists and writers. Um, one of our board members is a fantastic poet uh, who was formerly incarcerated uh, when he was a, a child for many years. Um, and he's you know, reading his work and, and thinking a lot about, actually was a ACLU intern, mm -hmm. um, Dwayne Betts. Um, and uh, I've learned a lot from, from poets and, and painters and musicians. And um, I, there, there's a way of reaching people. And, and so we've been, we've been working a lot with journalists on various, and artists on various projects. I've actually had a documentary crew following us around for the last year and a half. I don't know whether I'll ever come to anything. Um, but the ACLU produced a beautiful video about our New Orleans prosecutor case that I encourage everyone to go to the ACLU website and watch. Um, there's just something different about watching someone tell her story that you can't get in a legal brief. And actually, when, when Jeff was doing his presentation, I saw a photo of Eric Garner. And I pulled up on my, my phone a very, very short poem that I intended to read when I was talking. Because I think if, if a jury has read this kind of poem or, or if, if legal decision makers engage with this kind of work, I think it would be a very, very different legal landscape. Let me just read. It's a poem by uh, Ross Gay. Some of you may know, because um, I think it received some attention um, last year. But it's called... A small needful fact. A small needful fact. A small needful fact is that Eric Garner worked for some time for the Parks and Rec Horticultural Department, which means, perhaps, that with his very large hands, perhaps, in all likelihood, he put gently into the earth some plants which, most likely, some of them, in all likelihood, continue to grow, continue to do what plants do, like house and feed small and necessary creatures, like being pleasant to touch and smell, like converting sunlight into food, like making it easier for us to breathe. And I think poems like that, you know, uh, that um, make you feel something about it. it and when you, when you, I challenge you to watch the I Can't Breathe video again, think about that poem, think about his life. I think you'll, you'll feel a sense of urgency that's just not possible from a legal filing. And so we don't have the answers, and we're certainly playing around with different ways of doing it. But one thing is, is for sure, and it's we need to find a way of telling a different story about our criminal legal system. And until we do that, um, whether we win a couple of cases or not, uh, the system is going to reproduce the same set of injustices. If you, and this, these are available online, if you go and read the grand jury transcripts of the way that case was presented, you will be horrified. Um, the case was presented by criminal defense lawyers defending the police. The criminal defense lawyers just happened to work for the prosecutor's office. And one of the best examples is an expert that the state hired on marijuana, because Michael Brown had supposedly been smoking marijuana. And they went through about half an hour of testimony, and he gave all the statistics, and yes, the blood was tested, and he definitely had marijuana in his system. And the state's very happy. And then the expert, without being asked a question, just happened to throw in, I got to tell you, there are not many people that are smoking marijuana that are going out starting fights with police officers. The prosecutors went, this will be the one F-bomb, bat-fuck-crazy. <laughs> <coughs> they attacked this expert 
because the narrative that he had inserted into the case was not the narrative they were looking for. What I think is much more, I, should, I shouldn't say it that way, what I think is equally important is not the criminal justice maneuvers that went into deciding whether to prosecute that police officer. It's all the other things they found in the city of Ferguson that were going on. The email traffic between clerks talking about black defendants like animals. The email traffic between police officers. Exactly what Alec was talking about in terms of being completely desensitized to the kind of physical and emotional violence that's being inflicted on folks. And I will say, this is just my view, I will say it's easier to do when the people are black and brown because America has been used to that. We have been desensitized to that for our entire existence as Americans, which is one of the reasons why I think it is critical in our storytelling to go back to how did we get here in 2017? And when people are confronted with those facts, I think there is the opportunity for what I'll refer to as cognitive dissonance. Um, I think people, when they saw the picture um, in 1955 of the young man who was killed and beaten and burned, Emmett Till, I believe that on, on that Sunday morning, white America woke up, looked at their newspapers, and they said something like this. I know those colored people are causing, are causing a problem, but I didn't sign up for this. And it's that moment of, I didn't sign up for this where a federal judge may say, get the people here in front of me because I'm sick of this. I, I now have to look at this. I've had a naked lunch moment with what this really is, and it's the power of those stories that will make federal judges write opinions that other people can rely on. Um, I mean, so uh, on the. Oh, okay. I was. You're not gonna. You're not gonna want to hear my first answer, which was uh, abolishing all jails and police forces. Um, but so I do think that is realistic. By the way, if we adopt the right attitude, um, I think a, a truly just society would have no need for those things. I think we we create a need for those things because we have to try to keep our society extraordinarily unequal um, in a lot of ways, and it's just not a natural state of things for people. Um, but I, I take your question as wanting something a little bit more practical. I think um, what we're shooting for in the short term, um, until we can address bigger things like capitalism and, and racism more generally, um, is uh, eradicating the notion that anyone should be kept in a jail cell because she can't make a payment. So the decision about whether or not to put someone in a jail cell has to be made based on um, other legitimate, com compelling reasons. And in our legal system, we act this is another fact of our legal system, which is that, I'll just stand because I can't see you. Um, we, we already have pretty good laws. We already actually have laws that say, um, if you want to detain someone prior to trial, you have to have a compelling interest. And you can only do it when you make a finding that no other condition or combination of conditions um, would, short of completely incapacitating the person, would meet the government's compelling interest. Yeah. So, yeah, so that I think is the constitutional standard. Um, that's certainly what we're arguing and what Massachusetts Supreme Court just held, for example, is the constitutional standard and what I think every court that's ever been presented with that question will, has held and will continue to hold. Um, so what I think will end up happening is a system of preventive detention where, um, and I think our task is to limit um, the types of offenses which are eligible for preventive detention to, to just a, as narrow a category as we can get. So only the most serious of offenses are even eligible for presumptively innocent people to be kept in jail prior to trial. I think what we're like, if, if the current reform efforts of the ACLU and us and others are, are successful, I think we'll see states moving toward a model where extremely serious violent offenses are eligible for pretrial detention, but only after really rigorous procedures and findings are made. Um, so no longer will people be kept in jail on this sort of assembly line money-based 
uh, system. Nobody charged with lower level offenses is going to be kept in jail prior to trial. The plea bargaining assembly line will be ended. This is the sort of optimistic, realistic answer. And pretrial detention would be reserved for only those rare instances, a few percentage points. Of the, so in D.C., for example, um, uh, the pretrial release rate is 94 percent. Um, in Harris County, 40 percent of – and that's all felonies and misdemeanors, all cases in D.C. where I live. Um, and they don't use money bail anymore. Um, the – with some very limited exceptions that aren't relevant to your question, I don't think um, – Harris County, for example, detains 40% of all misdemeanor defendants. So I think what we're going to see is, is in Nashville, in Davidson County, def detains 60% of all misdemeanor criminal defendants. I think what we'll see is dramatic reduction in the detention of misdemeanors and low-level felonies, and then a replacement of the existing money bail system with one of preventive detention for the most serious criminal offenses. And then uh, the real battleground, as I mentioned during my talk, is going to be the the supervision industrial complex that, that develops to supervise all the people that are now being released. And that's what's very worrisome. You know, what is it, is it be GPS monitoring, drug testing? Are people going to be charged money for all these things like they currently are in most places? I think the real battle is going to be as, as the technological advancements happen and more and more people stop using cash bail. We're going to see the private prisons, the private probation companies, the bail bond industry is going to shift its business model to supervising people rather than being bail bond agents. Yeah, there's some positive outcomes for more pretrial services. Can I Do you want to jump in? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I just want to say I, I, this is incredibly dangerous, what we're talking about. You are talking about a surveillance state where people are walking around with GPS monitors, when they're checking with probation officers three or four times a week, and they're doing it as opposed to having $1,500 of bail. $1,500. How dangerous is a person going to be if they can get out of jail for $1,500? So you're not talking about dangerousness. You're not talking about somebody getting hurt. You're not even talking about risk of flight. Because how many poor black and brown people have the resources to run? Folks aren't going anywhere. So I, I think we have been raised on a narrative that, no, this whole bail and, and all of this surveillance of people is really necessary to keep us safe. And part of what I'm suggesting is this is a false narrative that we have swallowed whole. I've swallowed it, too. I mean, I'm not blaming anybody. This is a problem for all of us. All of us have swallowed this. But I believe what we cannot do is to turn the bail system into a money-making system for private corporations. And these corporations are already, the private prison corporations, they are already buying up private probation companies. They are getting ready for the ankle monitors because there's money to be made. So I just think this is a, a critical thing, and I agree with Alec. Probably the real game is going to be what kind of detention uh, are we going to have for people who are charged or accused of violent or serious felonies, and what are we going to replace money bail with. In my view, you let people out of jail and ask them to come back. Then you're not going to have a woman having to go through a guilty plea colloquy three or four times before she finally gets it right. What am I supposed to say? Because she's not going to have to go to jail or wait for a trial. She's going to go home. And if you think that innocent people don't plead guilty to crimes that they haven't committed, I am here to tell you, you are wrong. And I have 36 years of working in this system to know you are wrong. And the thing I will tell you is, uh, this is also from uh, Naked Lunch, wouldn't you? And the answer is, yes, you would. I guarantee you, every person in this room would plead guilty to a crime you did not commit if I put you in the circumstances of the people Alec is talking about. Every single person in this room. So I want to make sure that as we're talking about these reforms, we don't end up creating something that 20 years from now, Alec is going to be my age and somebody younger than him will be sitting here talking about, well, now we've got to try and fix it some other way. Jeff, my question for you is how, just 
um, I guess it's a descriptive one, which is how, how did you come to find out about the color and birth of the national anthem? It was so striking to me. I'm going to share it around. You know, I'm going to tell a lot of people. I feel like they're not going to believe it. I mean, it's, it, it really is that shocking. My question for Alex, uh, this is the second yeah. Uh, what I can tell you is um, I got interested um, in what our history was. And uh, some of that was personal with things going on in my life and my family. And I started to read. And every single thing that I showed you today is open for anybody to find. And I am making the ACLU chapter of Harvard Law School, bring me back up here, because I've got three and a half hours of stuff I have learned over the past seven years. I just spent three and a half hours speaking to a group in Mississippi yesterday, and a guy came up to me at the beginning saying, three and a half hours, really? You're going to talk about this shit for that long? <laughs> and I said, yeah, I am. And at the end of it, he said, I guess now I know why. This is available to all of us. It is just that we have been blind to it. And we have been blind to it because nobody teaches it. None of us got taught this in school. Your children are not being taught this in school. And so I think it is incredibly important for us to go and do the looking for ourselves and then have and be able to present that for people to actually think about in a, in a positive way. So I don't have nearly enough time to state all my views on this topic, which I think have been extensively documented. Uh, I will say, and I, and I want to preface my comments because I sometimes have been called too harsh about this. I don't think uh, the people that work at corporate law firms are bad people. I think that particular decision in their life is a decision that I think is morally wrong. Um, but I think that good people do morally wrong things all the time and are task in the world is to try to convince our friends and our family when we all, each of us all make mistakes. I want my friends and family to tell me, hey, I think you're doing something wrong and here's why. I think as far as your two reasons that are offered, I mean, it, making money to pay off loans would never in any other circumstance be a justification for doing something that is morally wrong. So in the last panel, someone asked a similar question. I gave the example. If someone told you, I'll give you $150,000 to pay off your loan, all you have to do is walk across the street and beat somebody up for it. Um, I, would, I, would, I wouldn't do it, and neither would they, because they think beating somebody up is wrong. So if you believe that helping corporations create a more unequal society, which leads to poverty and suffering and terrible environmental uh, consequences, terrible co for home foreclosures, um, all of the work that they've done to our tax system, all of the work they do for military industrial complex and corporate banks, if you believe all of that stuff is making our society worse, it's not an excuse to do it to make money to pay off your loans. Um, and, and you wouldn't yourself think of it as an excuse if the harm was right in front of you and direct, like being to told to beat somebody up. Um, and I think that the, the reason that it's become normalized is that so many of our peers do it, that we stop. It's be kind of like watching the judge in the courtroom every day. If you do something enough times, and it's happening every single day, you become desensitized to it, and you start to think it's normal. It's not normal to use this incredible gift that you've been given with this intellect and this, and this is education you're getting and the energy that you have um, every single day. It's not normal to use that to help um, the wealthiest people in our society be, increase the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, that's just my personal view. And I have many friends in corporate law firms, and certainly all the people that are funding our, or, our nonprofit organization have made a lot of money through that system. I don't think they're bad people. I think that particular choice um, is a really harmful one. And the reasons that are offered by Harvard Law School students don't hold water. 
I think it would be much more persuasive to me if they just said, I want to make money because I, I'm, I'm just being selfish about this one. Um, it's, it's also just similarly not true that they're getting the kind of skills. Every corporate law firm calls me. I get corporate law firm calls every single day. And they say to me, we really need to get our associates' experience and skills. Can we pro bono partner with you? Um, because they're not getting those skills in their document review litigation cases. So I think that doing public interest work instead of corporate interest work um, is a way of getting skills, doing something with your precious time on earth that you find meaningful and valuable. Um, it doesn't have to be public interest legal work. It could be teaching. It could be um, any. Or, any number of professions where it could be playing an instrument. I mean, do something that you find is, is really meaningful. And there's so few people, including not one of my colleagues, uh, who I, and I've done a survey 10 years after I wrote this article uh, called The Human Lawyer when I was leaving here about this question. Uh, I did a survey of my corporate law friends. Not a single one told me they found their day-to-day -day work to be morally meaningful. Um, some, several of them said that they appreciated the financial flexibility it gave them and their children and their families, and that was very important to them. But not a single one thought that they were doing morally good things with their work. And so I think that we, we should all just think, like, what kind of life do I want to live? Do I want to live a life that's consistent with my moral values? And I think if you ask yourself that question, you probably won't be saying things like, I need to go to a corporate law firm to learn litigation skills. Can you say one thing on that? I know we're out of time, but I have a different perspective because I've been out of law school for 36 years. It took me 23 years to pay off my law school loans because I couldn't pay very much because the kind of practice I did didn't make me a lot of money. It's the best loan I ever took out in my entire life. And it took 23 years to pay off. I live comfortably. I can go to the movies. I can travel and take a vacation. There is you know, pretty much anything I want to do, I can do. Um, but I'm not rich. But I wouldn't trade what I do and the work that I do for any amount of money. And one of the things I saw in my private practice were people, some of my clients were unbelievably wealthy. And it was very clear to me that wealth will not make you happy. So I would ask people just to think about that and to think about it for the first year, second year, and third year students here to think about not what's gonna happen in the next five years or the next seven years, where are you going to be in 25 years? This is, this is like a journey. It's not about getting it all right now or by the time you're five years out, you have your home, you have your car, you have your this, that, or whatever. Um, a course over your life is important to think about. And one thing I would tell them is I am really, really happy. I am financially secure, and I wouldn't trade the work I've done for anything. That's what they should think about. <laughs> so, um, this was a very fitting end of, um, for the bicentennial celebration because the, the, the goals of, the, of Harvard Law School and that we've touted in the bicentennials uh, is um, make, make people think and inspire. And the two of you have done that today. You've made us think and you've inspired us. And Jeff, I'm going to disagree with you. You said you're not rich. I think both of you are very rich. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it.